Hi, um, I'm Alison. I'm a diver and an archaeologist. I'm lucky enough to be able to combine those two things in my job as a maritime archaeologist at Historic England. Now, the main part of my work that I undertake really is the management of England's protected wreck sites. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the sites themselves, but also our management of them and how we've had a long-standing relationship with BZAC clubs that really does underpin all of the work that I do. So you really are very critical to us. As divers, we're all really rather lucky. Um, maritime archaeology, by its very nature, it's often out of sight, it's inaccessible, it lies deep beneath the waves. But as divers, we're really lucky enough to have a chance to visit the sites. There's currently only 52 sites that are protected under the Protection of Rex Act. Um, and they range hugely from the remains of things like late Bronze Age cargo scatters through to early 20th century submarines but they've shown how much these sites can add to archaeological knowledge. Um, they've illuminated diverse topics from contacts with the um, Mediterranean in the Bronze Age, right through to giving us detailed understanding of a Tudor warship in perhaps the most famous of the protected wreck sites, um, the Mary Rose. And I bet most people don't realise, because I didn't realise until I started looking at this, that the Mary Rose still has a BZAC special branch, which is attached to the Mary Rose specifically for work still on the site. And, um, so, I'm sure most of you know who English Heritage were. Um, I was part of English Heritage until April 2015, and at that point we split into two organisations. So, English Heritage, they kept the good stuff, really. They kept the properties, the charity side of the organisation. Um, and Historic England became the government's advisor on all aspects of the historic environment. And one thing we kept was the wrecks, so I suppose we kept the best stuff if I'm honest about it. Um, we're the public body now that look after England's historic environment. We're there to really champion historic places, but get people involved with understanding, valuing and caring for them. And the real challenge for us as an organisation is to really carry out our duties um, in the marine zone to the same standards that we do on land. And really, I hope by the end of, sort of my talk, you'll see that's where you as divers come into it, because we really need to work with you. So, BZAC Dive Clubs, you've had a long-standing relationship with England's protected wreck sites. From discovering the vast majority of the sites, I think many people here have helped contribute to that work, um, to helping ensure that their significance is recognised, through to taking on a custodian-type role for the sites. BZAC Dive Clubs have been there all the way. And this is a fact I think that's long been known, but I don't think, again, it was until I started looking into sort of preparing for this talk that it became clear to me just how many BZAC clubs are still involved with the sites today. We have management responsibilities for the sites, and I'll come on to what that means, but it's through the involvement of dive clubs throughout the country that we can ensure that the sites are monitored and protected for years to come. And the approach that we take to the sites um, is really that they're a shared resource for all to access and enjoy. Yes, access is a control for a licensing system, but we're really here to work with divers to guide them through that process. And I'll talk to you about how that works in a minute. So what exactly is a protected wreck site? Well, a protected wreck site is kind of exactly what it says. Um, it's protected under the Protection of Wrecks Act 1973, which is an act to, to essentially secure the protection of wrecks within 12 nautical miles, so within territorial waters, from interference by people who aren't authorised to be there. The way it works is the act designates a restricted area around a historic wreck, and it can be on account of its historic, archaeological, or even artistic importance. It can apply to just cargo, which in the case of some of the protected wreck sites is all that remains, and there's no actual wreck structure left. And the sites are generally, but not always, defined by a single position with a radius of, say, 150 to 300 metres around it. So the Act controls access to, but also any activity on the sites. Um, it's administered through a licensing scheme, which basically is signed off by the government department for culture, media and sport, but is actually administered by Historic England. So if you apply for a license, it'll be us that you talk to. Holders of um, licenses are termed licensees. They've, in many cases, been involved with the sites for many, many years. Um, they've all consistently shown their commitment, enthusiasm and support for these wrecks, which are of national importance. 
the rich and varied underwater cultural heritage of, of England, it's it, the whole UK, um, it's enjoyed by divers. I do admit some might show their enthusiasm in different ways, but we all really do appreciate it. Licensees work tirelessly on the protected wreck sites um, to help bring the sites alive um, for, for other divers, but also for people who are not able to dive. They're a unique breed of diver. They're certainly focused, enthusiastic, committed and dedicated. They essentially become voluntary custodians for the sites. Um, and some of them have taken on that role because they found the sites could be up to 40 years ago and they've continued that relationship with them. Now, I've been at Engl well, historic English Heritage, as we then were, since 2009. And at that time, when I first started, 78% of sites had licensees and dive clubs working on them. But we've been really working really hard to try and get that number up and to encourage more people to come forward and work on the sites. And it is starting to really work, but there's, there's new issues that we're sort of having to cope with, which I think are very similar to sort of issues that are reflected throughout the diving world, in that our licensees are really ageing quite rapidly, and we, we're not seeing a new audience coming through who wants to get involved with the sites in the same way. But we're quite clear that we really need to be actively encouraging a younger generation now um, to ensure that the good work continues for years to come, because otherwise, so for 10 years' time at the licensees meeting, it's going to be me talking to an empty room. So we do really need people to come forward and get involved with the sites. And I'd be really interested from anybody here so to come and talk to me at the back or talk to me outside of today about ideas of how you think we might be able to get people involved. BZAC divers have had this special relationship, and I think it's important we continue that. Um, we're hoping to undertake a new project um, funding the Nautical Archaeology Society in 2017 to see how we can work with BZAC University clubs, because it strikes me they would be a good target audience for us to work with, to build long-standing relationships for the future. So if there's any university clubs here who might like to be interested in a pilot, and it might be that we can even fund some diving um, for you to take place, again, do come and see me, because it would be good to hear from you. A good example of a club um, with a long-standing relationship on the, si on the sites is Northampton BZAC, um, otherwise known as the Southwest Maritime Archaeology Group. For over 20 years now, they've been working tirelessly um, in the Southwest, primarily in Devon. Um, they're licensees for four protected wreck sites, and they've won many awards. But from an archaeological perspective, they've done a huge amount for us because they've single-handedly changed our knowledge of Bronze Age trade in this country. So they're doing some massively important work. And they also have taken on an active role um, helping develop site security protocols. So again, really important stuff. <coughs> Anyone can apply to visit a protected wreck site. Um, it's always useful to pick up the phone or email me and contact me first because I can really guide you through that process. It may be um, that there's a visit scheme already in place on the site and it might be easiest to access it that way. Um, we've supported a number of dive trails and I'll come on to those in a minute um, because they're a really important way for us to be able to, to get people onto the sites. So if you apply, there's a series of things that, that you have to do as a condition of your license, um, comply with the conditions firstly, uphold archaeological principles, and take a lead in maintaining a relationship with Historic England, basically talk to me because I'm there to help you, um, and produce a yearly report. Now, the yearly report can be a really lengthy document if you've done something like a major excavation, could just be a short email to me to say, yep, yeah, we dived on the site, um, nothing huge to report. But we also give back um, to people who visit protected wreck sites. We're really interested in your knowledge, um, and we, we like to recognise that. We have a, a volunteer-type scheme, and if you can show that you've spent over 60 hours working on the protected wreck sites, and let's face it, if that includes your time getting your kit ready, travelling to site and everything else, it's very easy to do we can give you free entry to English heritage properties, which is something you may or may not be interested in, but it's a little something we like to give to licensees. So I mentioned dive trails. Um, they currently exist on a number of sites, the Colossus, Iona 2, Coronation, A1 and Norman's Bay, and it may be that some of you have even dived on these trails already. We've been working um, with White Dolphins, BZAC Group, on the Isle of Wight to install a dive trail on the Fourness Bay protected wreck site in the Solent, which will be launched um, early in 2017, I hope. 
and we, the sort of ethos behind it is that by encouraging responsible access to the sites, um, providing interpretation material and enhanced access, um, we really, really benefit from the divers' visits because divers are encouraged to share photos and um, information from their visits with us, which really helps our site monitoring. Also, we've really found that actually getting more divers on the sites actually prevents illegal access because an increased diver presence is hugely important for us. So BZAC clubs have been instrumental in creating and maintaining the current trails and um, ensuring that visiting divers have a good experience. I don't know if any of you have dived the um, Coronation Dive Trail down in Plymouth. Has anyone dived that trail at all? Well, quite a few, that's brilliant. Um, the two licensees for the site down there, Mark Pierce and Ginge Crook, have been hugely, hugely wonderful um, with their work on the site, installing that trail. And they, but they really feel that they've got something back from it as well, which is really nice to be able to report that it's, not, it's just not this one-way relationship. We're working together on all of this. To enable um, engagement with non-divers, we've been embracing new techniques of display and interpretation. And one such way is creating virtual dive trails that are sort of open to the public so that basically from the from the comfort of your own home computer or smartphone you can sort of use the internet to explore the sites and um, we're using things like photogrammetry but also increasingly techniques um, 3d techniques that are borrowed from the gaming computer industry to sort of really bring the virtual reality of these sites to light I'm reliably informed that less than 0.1% of the world's population dives. There's a huge amount of people that don't have access to this. And it, that's why we're going this route. But I think also they offer actually quite an interesting tool to you as divers um, as a resource to plan your dives before you go so you can see which bits of the wreck you may be interested in seeing. But also um, the sort of scoping out which sites you might like to actually go and visit. And I sort of kind of would like to take this as an opportunity that if you hadn't planned your dive club's itinerary for 2017, try and get a protected rec site on there and add it as part of your diving for next year. We're sort of quite keen that opening up these sites in this way um, presents lots of exciting opportunities, but also might be what we need to ensure the support and enthusiasm for wrecks and for, for maritime archaeology continues to grow and appeals to a next generation and the divers that we're so desperate to involve with the sites. So that's the sites that are already protected, but what about the other ones? Well, we have a strategic programme of assessing new sites, um, but anyone can also come and talk to us in the meantime. And if you'd like an informal chat, I really am at the end of a phone. Um, from the very start of any assessment work, it really is important to us that we work with local clubs so that they are part of the process. It's kind of critical for my work that, that we build that relationship right at the start of the process because if a site is protected, the only way we can actually protect it is if we've got a good relationship with the divers who are on the site all the time. Um, a good example of this was in 2013, we did some work in the Farne Islands. Um, the opportunity arose to work with BZAC Club Tyneside 114 at Gun Rocks. The site had originally been surveyed by the club in 1970, and their latest work was really looking at sort of resurveying the remains that were there. So again, a great example of a long-standing relationship with the site. Um, they described the project as successfully bringing together commercial state-of-the-art um, survey equipment and professional archaeology expertise with their local volunteer divers. And that's exactly what we are trying to do wherever possible to ensure that there's this two-way exchange of information. Um, their project work was so successful that they won the BZAC 2015 record. So some really good work from them. So as that shows, um, BZAC clubs have a relationship that's has lasted as long as the clubs in some cases, but we really do want this next generation to come forward, which is sort of what I keep saying today. So what do you need to be a licensee? Well, commitment's vital. Some people have been doing this for 40 years or more, so it's quite a long-standing thing you could get yourself involved in. Enthusiasm, we need people who are going to really champion the sites in which they're involved. I'm an archaeologist because at the age of seven I got taken on a school trip and an archaeologist showed me a muddy hole in a field and got me really excited about what that hole could tell people and it's only through doing that for the wrecks that we're going to have people who want to come and look at this stuff in years to come. Um, 
I think finally a bit of a touch of obsessiveness is needed by licensees too. I, I think if you speak to any licensee or anyone who's involved with the sites, they will tell you it can become quite an all-consuming passion with many hours spent both above and below water on the sites. But it also gives many hours of enjoyment back to the licensees and to the public who find out about their work. So that's kind of been the protected rec sites. I just sort of wanted to finish really with a bit of myth busting while I had the opportunity to speak to you all because constantly I get things sort of thrown at me from, from the diving community that aren't true. And I, I, I sort of, it's brilliant being able to say it to one person, but to be able to say it to so many is even better. So point one, historic England wants to stop us diving on wrecks. Not true. We really want everyone to dive on these sites. It's the only way we're going to find out about new sites and protect the ones we've got. Um, second point, once a wreck is protected, we can't dive on it anymore. Not true. Yes, visits are controlled through a licensing process. It's a free process. There's no cost. Um, it's easy to apply. And we're doing everything we can to get more people on the protected wreck sites. So it's all about increasing access. Third point, um, historic England are anti-excavation. Not true. Um, management of our protected wreck sites, management of archaeology is, when it's on the seabed, is described by archaeologists as protection in situ. And yes, it's our preferred approach in line with government best practice, um, but we know it's not suitable in all cases. Um, the ongoing high-profile excavation of the wreck of the London and the Thames estuary is a really good example of that. Um, and that project was designed to ensure that the volunteer divers who work on the site were actually part of the major excavation project. So we want to involve everybody with our work. And then the final point, which I think is kind of the one that I'm keenest to get across because I, I, I'm constantly saying it and nobody ever really believes me, but Historic England and the Marine Management Organisation were completely two separate bodies. Um, yes, we offer advice to MMO when requested, but we are completely separate. Projects we undertake ourselves on the protected rec sites still have to go through the whole marine licensing requirements. I still have to pay my fee to them and go through the whole process. So we are separate, but we can certainly offer you advice if you are going to deal with the MMO for anything. So finally, um, I just wanted to say a big thank you really to BZAC divers, both past and present. Um, everybody who's been involved with the protected wreck sites because your enthusiasm and love for the sites has been in critical, critical in ensuring that they've been protected and managed and that people are learning and enjoying from them into the future. So thank you.